Now that we hopefully have some understanding of the basic differences between an ideal gas and non-ideal gases, I want to talk a little bit about how we might uh, think about these more quantitatively, how we actually deal with the fact that uh, non-ideal gases don't really behave the same way. So what I want to do is I want to start with a, a close-up picture of our uh, compressibility diagram, or our compressibility plot. So remember that was plotting uh, the compressibility factor versus pressure. And um, at one, the compressibility factor basically mimics an ideal gas. So this gives us some sort of reference point to compare gases against an ideal gas. And we mentioned that for most gases, they decrease from here. So in other words, we tend to see um, a decrease that goes down something like this. You know, I'm drawing this for several different temperatures. So I'm increasing temperature as I go up here. Now, how could we model a curve that looks like this? Well, first of all, this is at pressures that are low enough that these curves really aren't curves, although I've drawn them kind of curvy. Um, they're really more or less like straight lines. But no matter what their actual form is, there is a way that we can typically model these kinds of things mathematically. Now, first of all, I want to note that at, in the ideal gas limit, we mentioned that this meant that the gas was very dilute. So that means that we have pressure nearing zero, so very, going to very small values, and our volume, our molar volume, going to very large values. I'll say going to infinity. But remember, I also introduced that factor of rho, which is sort of proportional to, I'll, I'll draw it that way, proportional to the molar volume. And rho then would go to zero if the molar volume is going to infinity. So one way we can think of this is, can we draw some kind of equation for this compressibility factor that reflects something that's roughly linear when we have small values of p or small values of rho. So how might, how might that look? Well, we might write something like this. We know that at zero, that is when rho is equal to zero, that's when we have an ideal gas. So that's when the compressibility factor would be equal to one. But then we would have a term, you know, let's call it constant A1 times the number density. Okay, so when the number density is very small, uh, we're, we're going to have what amounts to a linear equation here for the compressibility factor in terms of this number density. We might then have higher order terms. So I might have a second term here that would be uh, proportional to rho squared. And we could even have higher terms. Well, so what have we done here? Well, we've basically taken a function, and I'll write it formally that way, as z of rho, and we've basically made this into a power series expansion. Now, I know that power series are probably not your favorite part of mathematics, but they actually are very handy for scientists if we want to try to get some fundamental understanding of the behavior of something. Um, because a lot of times, uh, and this is one of those times, we can sort of confine our attention to these first couple of terms and still get a pretty good idea of what is going on in a, a non-ideal gas. So the way this actually works is rather than using this number density rho, we'll write it formally as a function of the uh, molar volume. And actually I'm going to make it a function of 1 over the molar volume so that we still have a quantity that goes to 0 uh, in the right limit. All right, so again, the ideal gas gives us the constant. And now these uh, power series expansion coefficients have a special symbology. We're going to write it like this. Now the 2v just tells us that this is the second term of this expansion, and it's in an expansion of 1 over the molar volume. All right, we would then have a next term, which is the third term, again in terms of the molar volume, but now it's going to be the molar volume squared, and so forth. And what we've written out here is something that is called a virial expansion, or a virial equation of state. All right, so these terms here, these B2V and B3V, because of their uh, 
displacement in this virial expansion are called virial coefficients. And so part of the game plan for scientists who are studying non-ideal gases is to try to characterize uh, what is the functional, well, not, not only the functional form, but what is the value of these virial coefficients? What can we learn from them? Now I should mention at this point that there is also a form of the virial expansion that is written in terms of pressure. Pressure is another quantity that, gets, that goes to zero at the left end of this picture. So if we write that out as a function of pressure, uh, we would then write something that looks like this. Now you notice I've put a different subscript on the virial coefficients because they are different from the ones that are useful for this first virial expansion, but they're related to one another. In other words, the second virial coefficient is equal to 1 over RT times the second virial coefficient for the one related to volume. All right, it's useful for you to know that these have a very set relationship. We're not going to exploit that here, but if you ever learn more about thermodynamics and learn more about non-ideal gases, that could be a useful um, factor to know. Now, if one were to graph what these coefficients look like, notice that the slopes for all of these curves are negative. That is, they're sloping downward as you move to the right. That means that the virial coefficient themselves, and I'm going to focus on the second virial coefficient now, these virial coefficients are negative and they come up and they tend toward zero as we go to high temperature. So in other words, these are in fact functions of the temperature. So they will change as temperature changes and that is reflected by the curvature in this compressibility factor as we move uh, move to higher temperatures here. So we're moving to higher temperatures, so we're changing the slope of that curve. All right, for different substances, they would follow a similar trend, and they would all kind of come up here. They actually go a little bit above zero to a shallow uh, maximum. Uh, that's a detail that we won't worry about, but there is some uh, physical significance to that, uh, which uh, you can learn about if you learn more about these virial equations. All right, but the, the main point is that these are all negative quantities, negative slopes. The only ones that don't show this are typically very light molecules like helium or hydrogen. All right, but uh, those are exceptions to the rule. Most of the molecules that uh, you will probably ever care about uh, have a negative uh, second virial coefficient. Now we can also model this second virial coefficient, and uh, this is a useful equation to, to know that it exists. I'm not going to ever use it in a problem, but the second virial coefficient as a function of temperature can be written in the following way. And this is Avogadro's constant out front. It can be written as an integral of this intermolecular potential energy. Now notice that uh, we have all the trappings here of having used spherical polar coordinates. We've got the r squared dr as our volume element. We're going from zero to infinity. We've got a factor out here that suggests that uh, perhaps there was a factor of four pi that came from the isotropic distribution of molecules relative to one another. All of that is absolutely true. So the second virial coefficient, basically, is going to draw its value largely from the form of this intermolecular potential, this intermolecular force. So if it's a Leonard-Jones force, that would give you one form for this virial coefficient. In fact, the virial coefficient is often used to help fit the coefficients for a potential like the Leonard-Jones potential. There's another, uh, there's another relationship, though, that I would like for you to know about for the second virial coefficient, and that's the following. That um, if I were to define something like the ideal molar volume, the ideal molar volume would simply be RT divided by the pressure. All right. Now, if I define ideal volume this way and I distinguish it from the actual molar volume, then it turns out that I can define or interpret the second virial coefficient as being essentially equal to the actual molar volume minus the ideal molar volume. And there's a way that you can demonstrate this mathematically, but I think it's more important to see this relationship like this rather than to worry about exactly how we get here. 
All right, as I mentioned, um, in practice, what one typically does is the following analysis. You would first run some experiments. So you would experimentally measure this compressibility factor at several temperatures. Okay, having then learned what that is, you would then perform a linear fit. And I'll say near P equals zero or rho equals zero. And that linear fit is going to give you a slope in which the, sl the value of the slope is the second virial coefficient. You can then use that second virial coefficient to basically to map your intermolecular potential. So this is a, a key way that we use these virial coefficients to learn something about this key element that is in, in general very difficult to ascertain um, other than computationally. So if we want to get some sort of care, uh, experimental verification of those intermolecular potentials, the second virial coefficient is what helps us do that.